chair and vice chair of the board are both uh, not here, absent from the meeting. Uh, so uh, based on the rules of procedure that this board has, a chair needs to be selected from, from the group, uh, among the group. The chair had recommended that we uh, appoint uh, Mr. McDowell as the chair to run the meeting today. So it really needs to be a recommendation from from you all to, and a second and then a vote, please. Um, I make a motion that Mr. McDowell serve as chair while the current chair is absent. Second. I second. Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll call the vote, I guess, today. Uh, so all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Oh, Christina will call it, sorry. Joe Zach? Yes. David McDowell? Yes. Bridget McCandless? Yes. Sherry Tindall? Yes. Anthony Jeremita? Yes. All right, very good. And we're here to support you, sir. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Christina, will you call the roll? Larry Porter? Les Boatwright? Joe Zach? Here. David McDowell? Here. Bridget McCandless? Here. Sherry Tindall? Here. Anthony Jeremita? Here. Uh, I need a motion to approve the minutes of the December 16th meeting. I move to approve. I second. It's been moved and seconded. We approve the minutes of the December 16th meeting. Christina, will you call the vote? Joe Zach? Yes. David McDowell? Yes. Bridget McCandless? Yes. Jerry Tindall? Yes. Anthony Giermita? Yes. Next item on our agenda today is open house. Yes, sir. Uh, so I'll, I'll address that. So at the, the last uh, PUAB meeting, uh, actually the two previous PUAB meetings, there was a discussion about having a public forum or an open house. And then the city council had a public hearing on uh, you know the electric rates and, and various, various items. Uh, then the, the following PUAB meeting, you know, I brought up uh, whether or not further a public a further public hearing or public forum was wanted by the board, um, and there didn't seem to be consensus on that direction. So I just wanted to come back and reaffirm: d Does the board still want to have some kind of forum, or um, and what what would that should include? And we'll start working on an agenda and and a program if that's the case and bring that back for the board to consider at the next meeting and then start making concrete plans. So that's that's really what this is about. Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead, Bridget. Um, I, I still feel very strongly that the issue of new generation is so important um, and whether that's new generation or the options around what that portfolio might look like, that we need to have public education and public forum, I think those are two separate items. One talking about what our possibilities are and one with the discussion. Perhaps they happen at the same event, but I think they are twinned goals. Um, I do know that Indy Energy is going to have a, a public uh, meeting on Zoom on, let's see, I wrote it down somewhere, February 26th at 10 a.m. to talk with people who are experts in the field around future energy generation, but that's more in the theoretical. That's not in the practical application to what choices lay before us. Um, so that would be my strong opinion that we need to have a public forum on new generation. Is there any other discussion? Go ahead. So just want to make sure we're happy to work on an agenda and some programs for that, but I but I'd like some consensus from the rest of the group if that's if that's the desire, because this will take Adam, quite a bit of staff time to do Adam, this. Uh, Bridget and I have had a couple discussions about the public input, and we, we believe it's very important. And I was just enlightened today that that's actually part of our bylaws. Um, we just need to let the public know that they can come and speak here. and. There is a proper procedure that has to be done. Christina, where did she go? I'm right here. <laughs> Don't scare me like that. <laughs> Would you kind of enlighten everybody the procedure 
for public to come and speak before this board? So this would not be for an actual public hearing or meeting that you're referring to? I think what you're referring to is like if someone wants to just come and say something to the board at a meeting. Yes. So the Friday before the meeting, they would have to let me or the chair know that they want to speak and the topic. And then it would be approved by the chair or not approved. And then they would be put on the agenda. And they're given up to five minutes to speak to us, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. I think, you know, that takes a lot of pressure off of us having a so-called public hearing. Now, there's nothing wrong with a public hearing once we have a topic, but to go into just having a public hearing, I've been very much opposed to. Is there anything else that would, anyone else would like to speak on that? Mr. McDowell, can you clarify? I'm not sure I understand. You think that we shouldn't have a public hearing because people could come and make a statement here? Is that your thoughts? No. My, I, I'm sorry if that's the way I came across. There's nothing wrong with a public hearing if we have a topic, but to just have a public hearing I think would be a mistake. As far as giving the public an opportunity to speak in front of this board, I think is a wonderful idea. I mean, we need to know what the public is wanting us, what direction they would like us to go. So we, we do have that in our bylaws, so people can come and speak before this board. Mr. Chair? Yes. I, I would agree with you. Um, I, I would agree with you. I think that we need to have a more concrete idea of what direction we're going to go before we have a, a public hearing. I, 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 I think it would be more helpful if we had a direction that we were going to go, then you ask for the public's input. You, you get their input, and then that influences whether we want to continue going down that road or whether we need to make changes to, to what our original ideas were. I totally agree. Is there any other discussion? I guess I'd like to comment. I agree that I like the targeted idea where we have our reasons behind our decision and then do they maybe have an opposition to those reasons? You know, it would be, you know, our idea, reason, 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 and if they have an opposing idea, they need at least three reasons why, you know, our idea wasn't as good as theirs. So that's why I like this. Um, it wouldn't just be shooting at the moon with, you know, random notions that people might have. But um, I do think we could incorporate a little bit about conservation, you know, within the home and things that on a you know public level, people might need reminders about how to lower their own bill instead of complaining. <laughs> you know, because we've we've heard, for example, from uh, Larry that it's a complain fest and things like that when it gets off topic. So, I think it would be good to have you know the safety house and things that the IPL has um, to round out the experience, but maybe that targeted thing where we have a plan or an idea and here are our reasons. Um, I do agree that that's a good idea. I, I didn't start out thinking that, so you guys made a good point. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? This is very helpful, thank you. You're welcome, Adam. Looks like we're asking for reports, the finance and administration. So Cindy is on the phone, I think. Um, we can we couldn't get teams to work. So if there are questions, we'll do our best to field those via phone. Would you like us to skip to the municipal services and come back to that? I think we're squared away here. Cindy, can you hear us? I can. Can you all hear her okay? Yes. Okay. Well, hello. Sorry, I'm not there in person. Um, I am 
Cindy Gray, the CFO, and we'll be presenting the financials for the PYD for the month of November. As of right now, um, I feel like a broken record. Uh, we are trending on all three utilities according to budget. Um, we are on track as we have been for the uh, since the beginning of the year, obviously. Um, I don't really have anything other than to say uh, our actual percentage is 41.67 for five months, and we are right in line in all areas. Is there any questions? Hearing none, thank you. Thank you, You're Cindy. <clears throat> Who goes first on the municipal services? <laughs> yes, Ms. Phillips. Good afternoon. Um, I don't have any real reports for you today. I just wanted to give you an update. Um, from the last meeting, we were supposed to be and expecting our um, bioset for the treatment plant for the biosolids project to be delivered this month. And um, while Yay, we got parts and the supply shortage seemed to cease. Um, the manufacturer now has several people out with COVID. So um, they've told us now it will be mid-February when that is delivered. So I just didn't want you guys um, wondering. So just wanted to give you that update. Any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Montgomery. Dan Montgomery, Water Systems Director. Like Lisa, I really don't have anything that I was bringing to you, but it just spurred with talking to Lisa just before the meeting that it might be a good time to remind folks that the sewers are based off the winter quarter average. And so what that means is we take the winter usage in December, January, February, or January, February, March, depends on when your billing cycle is. And we look at the usage during that period of time of water use in residential homes. And from that, we set up, if that's the smallest number, it usually is because you're not watering your yard or washing your car, that kind of thing. But it's a great time to remind, to check your everything in your house to make sure you don't have a small leak, uh, pull the top off your uh, toilets, put some food coloring in the back of it. If it shows up in a stool without flushing, you got a leak, you got the stoppers leaking, or it's, uh, oftentimes you pull that lid, water will be going over the overflow. You don't hear that, you don't see that, but that certainly adds up on these sewer bills. And I answer so many questions from customers concerned that their water bills this, my sewer bills twice this, I've got all these costs, and I'm just giving you a heads up, this is a great time to go home, check your, uh, toilets, look for any kind of a leak, and uh, listen for it. If you have a, what I say, a phantom flush, you might be sitting in the living room and all of a sudden your stool flushes. That usually means you've got a leak, it's trying to refill, and when that happens, you got a leak going on. So these are just some, kind of sounds like common sense, but I don't know, I go over to my son-in-law's house, off the back, look, water's running over the top of it, you know, I, I just have a natural thought process to look for those things. So. I looked at mine, I tested mine, and sure enough, had a small leak. So I had to put a new flapper in. So I'm just encouraging people, this is just a good time to, it's always a good time to wash it, but it's a really good time because this is gonna affect your sewer bill for the next 12 months. So just a heads up. Thank you. Mr. Nail. Jim Nail, Power and Light Director. Uh, to just kind of tag on to what Dan was saying, that winter quarter, it's very, very important that we get every meter read in January, February, March, so that we have accurate numbers. Uh, in order to do that, one, we, we absolutely need the cooperation of the public to make sure that those meters are accessible, that we can get to the meters and get the readings. Um, it also, it ends up being a high, a high period of overtime for us because between between illnesses, whether that's COVID or colds and flu, um, or uh, days that it's below the threshold for wind chill, or days that it's it's storming and we can't get out, 
in order to make up those reads, um, our, our uh, meter readers do an, an outstanding job of supporting us with working late, coming in on Saturdays, and getting those reads done. But it's very important that we get those during January, February, March. So uh, that's just one consideration to, uh, to be aware of for our, our not only our cost, but again, the, the cooperation needed from the public to make sure we get those. Um, we've got several major uh, capital projects that are underway. Uh, over on the west side, the border of Independence and Kansas City, we're replacing a one of our main transmission lines that runs north and south. Um, we've been working on that for several years and we're making good progress on that. We do have some, we do we run into some delays with delivery issues. Uh, we can't always get the, the poles on time or, or some of the parts and components that we need, but we're working through those issues and continuing to make progress on that line. Also, uh, substation K, which is down off of 39th and Arrowhead, down there behind the, the Coles um, store, uh, that, that is, we're working well on that one. Uh, we have several components that are due to be delivered and installed, and that will allow us to put the, start putting that substation, the new section of the substation into service here over the next couple of months. So we're working well on that project. Now, I have a presentation for you. Is this one on? Yeah. Over the last year, two years, we've had lots of questions about you know, what is in our future, what is our position, uh, why are we in this position. Um, we've, we've answered some of these questions multiple times in various venues, but I thought it was important as, as our staff, right now we have received six proposals and the, our staff, along with a, an engineering consultant, are going through those in, in great detail to make sure we have a, a very thorough analysis of all those proposals. While they work on that, I thought it was important to set the stage and have a conversation with you all to just kind of go back over um, what has, how we've gotten to the point we are and uh, what the future looks like. Just as a recap, um, to make sure everybody understands, because we, we frequently get questions about this. Southwest Power Pool coordinates all the transmission and generation throughout a 14-state region, including us. As part of that, they monitor how much, is, how much electricity is being used here in the Kansas City area, up at Omaha, down into, into Texas, um, all that throughout that region, and they have to balance that. They have to make sure that the that the flows are balanced so that one area is not being stressed more than another. Then they schedule generation resources to meet that demand. Um, they've got several different criteria they use, but they have to one they have to meet the de the demand for electricity being used, and they have to do so in a way that guarantees or maintains the stability and reliability of the grid. As part of that, they supply all the electricity. Regardless of where it comes from, SPP supplies all the electricity to its members. So we purchase all of the energy that we consume, we purchase from SPP. The advantage is that it's done at a, the lowest average cost to deliver that electric, to produce it and deliver it. In return, we're obligated to maintain generation assets that are capable of producing all of our demand plus a 12% margin. That can be done in a variety of ways, capacity contracts, purchase power agreements, actual generation that we own and control, all of that together uh, goes to meet that obligation. Then Southwest Power Pool, we do a reconciliation uh, actually, it's it's done almost a continuous basis because as different bills come in, they, they readjust it. But independence or gets credit for any of our generation portfolio that is contributing. So if IATAN 2 is running, we get a credit from SPP for the portion that, that, we, that we support. If our combustion turbines are running, we get a credit for that generation. Uh, and then it, that offsets... The, uh, the bill that we pay for the energy that we buy. Here's a, a list of what our portfolio consists of currently. 
RCTs, Dogwood, ITAN 2, Nebraska City 2, uh, the Smoky Hills and Marshall Wind Farms, our capacity contract for Moneta. I've listed the solar farms, but it's, it's important to understand the, the solar farms are not credited to Southwest Power Pool. It's more like if you had solar panels on your house, it, de it decreases what you have to take from independence. Uh, if you are, for us, our solar farm reduces the load that we have to take from Southwest Power Pool. But I wanted you to see that number. Now, some of these numbers may look strange to you. Smoky Hills, four megawatts. Marshall, 6.7. The solar farm, 2.9. And you're thinking, it's more than that. It's bigger than that. Well, the generation capability is, but because renewable assets have a lower reliability, lower capacity factor, we only get credit for a portion of that. So while we may have, um, we may have a total of 50 or 60 megawatts from wind, we're only getting capacity credit for four and 6.7. Our solar farm is 11.3 total, but if it were, if this were a, a credited generation resource to SPP, we would only get credit for the 2.9. So it's important to, to keep that, that number in mind. So altogether, and I did not include the solar farm, but altogether our capacity there shows uh, 339.8 megawatts, so 340. Our total obligation currently, and that's our load plus that, that safety margin, is 333. So at the moment, we have a little bit of excess in our portfolio. That changes pretty quickly. Now I have not, I haven't subtracted the CTs because we'll discuss that separately, but the Smoky Hill contract currently expires in 2029. Oneta, that contract expires in 2030. And you can see on down the list when those contracts expire. Now certainly we have options. We can, uh, the uh, Marshall, Smoky Hills, Nebraska City, IATAN, those, those agreements are somewhat for the life of the facility. It's estimated to end at that point, and then we'll have options to renew or extend the contracts as, um, as those facilities have further life beyond that. But those, will be, those could be renegotiated. Prices could be different. Um, we'll have to wait and see as, as the time gets close. But you can see that over the next 10 to, over the next 10 to 20 years there's a big change in our our portfolio so we have to do something to replace that capacity um, here it just kind of puts it into a visual form the black solid line is our projected demand the dashed line is that 12 percent surplus and you can see that if you and now this this diagram here also assumes that we retire the, the CTs because that's that's been part of the discussion for several years now. They're old, they require you know a million dollars of maintenance. Um, we don't want to keep putting money into them if it's not cost effective. So if you if you assume that somewhere along the line the J, I, and H substation CTs will be retired, you can see what that does to our, our accredited capacity puts us into a situation where down at the end there, we have 163 megawatts that we have to make up from in some way or combination of ways. Now, obviously there's multiple ways we can do that. We can do, again, capacity only contracts like Oneta, uh, power purchase agreements like we have with the wind farms, uh, IATAN and Nebraska City, uh, ownership partnerships like Dogwood or our own city generation. We believe, IPL staff, we believe that a, a mixed balanced portfolio is, is the best answer for that uh, for a variety of reasons. One, um, there's a portion that you control. Two, there's portions you can get at lower prices depending on what the contracts are. Um, and you can, you can balance that different fuel sources, uh, different different parts of the SPP region so that it has different transmission impacts. Um, but we, we think that a, a mixed 
portfolio was probably continues to be the right answer. Several things we have to consider. What's the timeline? It takes several years to design and construct a new generation resource. Um, unless you're buying some off the shelf generator that you could just wheel in and plug in, but you still have to, you still have to uh, build and design the electrical connection piece of it. The location, if it's here in Independence, then pretty much the, the operating cost is the expense. If it is outside of Independence, we also have to pay the transmission expense for that, assuming, assuming that power was actually produced and transported to Independence, that transmission cost becomes part of, of the uh, calculation. SPP approval, any generation connection, any new transmission circuits have to be approved through an engineering study by Southwest Power Pool. Last year, they were still considering projects that were proposed in 2017. So a four to five year timeline to get through that engineering study. They did come up with an alternate path. If you're replacing generation to the same level or less at the same location, then you could go through the shorter individual study. Another big difference is that that conglomerate study they do that takes four to five years, they lump a whole, no, a whole group of projects all together and they assess the overall impact on the transmission grid and they'll identify where this piece is overloaded, this piece is overloaded, uh, we need to build some, trans, change some transmission, build out some new structure. Everybody in that study shares in that cost even if your piece contributed nothing to it. So when we're doing, when we're considering getting contracts with remote sources, we will have a transmission cost assessed to that. If we are building our own new facility outside of where we already have one, we'll pay those transmission costs. Clarifying question: um, What what is generally transmission cost? So is it a percentage of the amount of energy you use, or or how is that calculated? They, they assess what infrastructure improvements would have to be made, how many miles of high capacity transmission line, how many substations, how many addition, what additional uh, infrastructure would have to be added to get that energy to where it's needed. So the cost of those transmission lines, substations, transformers, that's what goes into that, that transmission cost. So if we already have a partnership with Nebraska City or IATAN, the transmission capability already exists. Are those requiring upgrades or, or being replaced or those are already fixed costs that we've paid for and that still continues to be available? That depends. And the reason I say that is, we have, let's say it's uh, 50, 56, I think, megawatts from Nebraska City. So the study has already been done to verify that we can transport 56 megawatts from Nebraska City to us. If we decided we want to contract for 100, that has to be studied because you're, you're, de you're increasing the amount and that would have to, be go that would have to go through SPP's study process. And so when you said we are responsible for the cost, the cost of the study or the cost of putting in new infrastructure or both? Both. You have to, you have to put down a deposit um, in order for SPP to include you in the study. And that's kind of to guarantee that you're serious. And then once they determine what the costs are and they determine what your share is, then you're responsible for that transmission, for those transmission costs. And when you said if the group is evaluated as a unit and ours doesn't change anything, we are still responsible for the cost. Yes. Does that mean the cost of transmission to Oklahoma or help me understand that piece? Let's say they had, let's just say they had 10, 10 new generators, um, one here in Independence and several scattered around the rest of the region. 
they would assess the transmission improvements to support all 10 as a, as a group. And then the transmission upgrade costs would be divided among those 10 projects. Based on the amount they use or based on the transmission changes needed for your individual area? Based on the group. So like if we had, if it was, if it was 100 megawatts and ours was 10, we would be responsible for 10% of that cost. Even if our 10 really didn't require a change. That's why the, the replacement process is so important because if, we, if we're going to replace generation at Blue Valley, we already know the infrastructure supports it. We can get them to assess it on a shorter time frame and that we would not have anybody else's transmission costs added into the picture. However, again, the requirement is it has to be an equal or less amount that already exists at that location replaced at that location. So you can't, you can't take the Blue Valley plant, retire it, and replace it somewhere down in Southwest Independence. It has to be at that location. We missed, we missed out on that technically because we didn't know about it at the time we shut down Blue Valley, but FERC did grant us a waiver. They said that was a reasonable request. They granted us a waiver to go ahead and use the Blue Valley site, but we only have a 36 month window to take advantage of that. So if we wanna take advantage of that location, we have to have something in 36 months. When is that deadline? Uh, that would be, um, well, it, it was granted in October of 20. So the We're end of 23, uh, or I mean, I, I'm sorry, October of 21. So the end of 24 would be the three year, three year window. Okay. And that's for construction and operate. That, that is to, to be operable. FERC's, FERC's order says in operation, 36 months. Well, that's, and that's doable. That's doable. What is FERC? FERC is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, they set the rules for all the different energy resources. And that's a, and that's a federal commission. Mr. Dahl? Yes. If you had approval to go ahead and build on the Blue Valley site, how long would it, would it take you to get that facility up and running? We are, the, the bids that we're evaluating um, in there, we, one of the things that we put in our bid request was that they be able to meet this 36 month timeline uh, and six different companies responded. So um, it gets tight and, and depending on any delays we might hit due to whether it's funding constraints or supply chain issues, um, you know, obviously I can't speak for FERC and SPP, but um, I would assume that they would work with us if we're making a good faith effort, but the target is to have it in operation in 36 months. You also said that as long as the capacity was lower than what was previously there, correct? Equal, equal or lower. Okay, so what kind of numbers are we looking at? What did we have before and what are we looking at for the future? Well, at the Blue Valley site, we, act, we had, uh, originally we had I think there's approximately 150 megawatts on location there. We had the three boilers and we had a large combustion turbine. Um, the most recent retirement and what we asked the waiver for was um, 108 megawatts was that we didn't consider the, because it was, it was retired back in like 2007. Uh, we didn't include the, the capacity for the combustion turbine in our request. Okay. Yes. Mr. Chair. So understanding you've got this 36 month, which is already shortened window, what is the timeline for you to have to make a decision and enter into contracts? What is our decision period? The, the bids that have come in, um, I think they guaranteed their price for 120 days. Uh, so we would have to have a decision to them. Um, now, obviously, taking four months off of that 36 is going to put a strain on the on the timeline. But um, we have to make the award. We have to provide the technical data to SPP so they can complete their technical review. Um, and we have to get 
the the funding in place. There's a lot of pieces that have to happen up front, uh, including uh, submitting requ uh, requests for environmental permits. All of those things will be taking place kind of in parallel. Uh, the in, the engineering design work, a lot of that will be in operating in parallel while we wait on some of these pieces to come together. Do you have a, a timeline that you can share with us so that we can see? Because it sounds as though we have a very compressed window for decision making. I don't, uh, other than, like I said, we know that uh, we are supposed to have, we're supposed to have our technical data submitted to SPP uh, by the beginning, at the beginning of February. Now we will have, we are reviewing, we're reviewing the, all the proposals now. And the target for that was to have that finished by the end of January. So we'll, we'll have what we fully expect to be the solution. Um, and we'll submit that to SPP. After discussing with the public, with you all, with with the city council, if there are some changes to that, we can inject some of that and work with SPP to uh, update the the review. But uh, you you are correct. We're on a we are on a tight a tight window if we want to take advantage of that opportunity. So can this be done sequentially? So can you begin the process for a portion of it? As I mean. Are we being asked to consider biting off 108 megawatts of generation as this is your only choice? Are there other gradations in between? Will you present those? I'm just trying to understand yes. the process. In the, in the proposal, we asked for a range of say anything from, from 45 to 108. We figured uh, 45 would be a small, you know, a small single standalone generator. Um, whether it's a combustion turbine or a couple of the, the recip engines, uh, up to a max of the 108. The proposals came in all through that. There's a variety of things for us, us to consider, and we'll be able to, to make a choice. Uh, and the, the proposal also said we reserve the right to award all or a portion. So we, we, will, we control that. And so the next steps would be you finish your evaluation, you negotiate with SPP, and then you come and make a presentation to PUAB. And I'm just trying to think, there's a lot of information in there. I would imagine our monthly cadence will not serve your timeline. So I'm anticipating we will need some regular meetings to be able to get updates from you so that we can be part of that thought process. As soon as we finish the evaluation, I will be working with Adam and the city manager's office to schedule um, whatever information sessions we need to make sure that everybody has the information they need to make an informed decision. And so one part of it is the technical question of how do they do it? What does that cost? Does the site accommodate it? Does the transmission? Right. Okay, so that's one question. The other questions are, what are our other options in mm -hmm. generating our own? And I assume that complete analysis will be part of your discussion with us. Yes. And then the third question is, say we decide we need to replace some combustion turbines, what does the financing of that look like? What does that structure look like? What is the time obligation for the city? What does that look like with our bond rating? I mean, there are are serious financial concerns in there when you're looking at, do we purchase from someone else versus do we build our own? Absolutely. Uh, and we've, uh, we've been keeping uh, city staff, the finance department, we've all been uh, keeping everybody informed uh, along the way as we look at what the different implications are so that as we, as we get closer to making a recommendation, uh, we'll have that kind of information so that you'll be, be able to consider that. So I'm going to bug you one more time. What is your timeline? Are we talking about we have to make this decision in three weeks, four weeks, eight weeks? I really am just trying to understand so we can make ourselves available to you. In my position, sooner is better, but there's a lot of pieces that have to come together. Um, I would hope that over the next over the next two to three months, we could have this done. Um, but like, there's there's a lot of moving parts. And all of that has to come together to, to, where, to make sure we're in the right position to make that choice. 
and I, I will keep you, you and the council and city staff informed every step along the way. Thank you. All right, we already mentioned the FERC waiver, the 36 month window. Uh, market opportunity is another thing that has to be considered. Um, if we build something, will we get a chance to run it? If you, if you have too large of a unit, then it's only gonna be called on when SBP needs a lot of power. Um, if you have a unit that is not very efficient, it's not gonna be called on uh, unless they have a dire need that they, uh, I mean, our, our oil units actually get called on on a fairly regular basis to run for a couple of hours when SPP has no other, no other option but independent start up. We want to maximize the availability of our unit to be able to run and generate those credits to help offset our energy purchases. So one of the things in, in the proposal, we, we asked for an evaluation from all the bidders. You know, what is your efficiency rating? How low can you go? What's the efficiency rating when you're down at that low level? Uh, we're running that through our marketing partner, Tanaska, to do an evaluation based on the past, the past year of SPP's operation. When would our units have fit? When would these proposed units fit? So what we have some idea how much operation would we, could we count on or how much operation could we hope for based on a normal year? Um, that will be included in the evaluation. And then obviously we wanna look at developing technologies. Uh, you don't wanna do something that's gonna lock you in and then uh, actually get in your way from taking advantage of other developments. So if you do a modest, a modest investment now that, that kind of a stopgap measure, over the next 20, 30 years, there's going to be big changes in technology we want to be positioned that we can take advantage of those as they develop. Now, to put some perspective, because a lot of people say, well, you know, this is the cheapest or this is the cheapest. Here's some actual numbers for you. We spend, and I did a three-year average, although the CTs is a year and a half because I, I only started it. I started the CT analysis when we shut down Blue Valley because I didn't want I didn't want any boiler costs to, to cloud the picture. So we are spending, including capital, we're spending about 4.73 million a year to, to manage those CTs. They don't run very often, it has been pointed out repeatedly. So we don't get a lot of revenue back from them. Net cost is 4.36, but that's 90, 6.3 megawatts of capacity that we get credit for. So it, it costs us to have that capacity in our portfolio, $46,000 per megawatt. Now compare that to these some of these others. Look at our coal plants, Iatan and Nebraska City, 97,000 a megawatt, 226,000 a megawatt. Somebody asked, well, why is Iatan so high? During the construction of Iatan 2, there were numerous delays and changes that by the time the project went into operation, it had doubled in cost. We pay those costs. We don't, we're buying energy from them, but we're paying those operating costs and construction costs. Uh, Smoky Hills and Marshall, 337,000 a megawatt and 133. That's because they only get credit for a portion of their, of their nameplate capacity. Um, Oneta is Oneta is the cheapest, but it's only capacity. We get no energy from it, and so we get no no offsets from it. And keep in mind, at the time the Oneta contract was negotiated, the country across the country there was a, a pretty much a surplus of capacity available. Since then, numerous plants have been already been shut down, and more are on the more are on the chopping block. So by the time 2030 gets here and we need to get another capacity contract, the capacity that's left is gonna be in higher demand. What's the price gonna be? We don't know that yet. Um, the solar farms, again, um, the contract that we've got is what it is. 
Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about that lately, but um, it costs us about $850,000 a year. Um, but again, we have by having this, we have a diverse portfolio. We have some some solar, we have some wind, we have some coal, we have some gas. Um, the only thing we don't have is hydro and nuclear, but uh, not likely we're going to tap into those. So anyway, the point of this is you can see that there's our, the resources we have, there's a wide variety of what it actually costs us for the capacity. And that's that's the key point, because it really doesn't matter how much generation you have. It's the capacity that we're supplying to SPP. So the CTs don't run very much, but they only cost us 46000 a year per megawatt for the capacity they provide. As long as we are able to keep them, that's a relatively low cost source of capacity. In fact, as we, as we move through this project, my, my position would be build the, new, build the new unit, get it into operation, and then as long as those CTs last, sell that capacity to somebody else. Um, use them as a revenue source until, they, until they're not worth keeping up. But again, the main thing was to give you just some perspective of what the different costs are for those different resources. So, so the 46,000 per, per, per megawatt is based on old CT. Yes, our existing, our existing CTs. Right. So can you guesstimate? I would imagine that price is going up with new construction. We are building that into the evaluation. We're looking at what that, what that annual operating cost is going to be. Thank you. Okay, our recommendation, a multi-phase project, uh, I think... To, to say that we're going to jump off a cliff and do 163 megawatts of, of generation right now, that's probably not a reasonable approach. So we think probably what we could do is a multi-phase project where we get a piece now, and then as, as time, that gives, us, that gives us a window of opportunity to look at other resources. As technology changes, we're not, we don't bite off too big of a chunk all at once. We get a piece that we a piece to support the next 10, 15 years while we develop the next phase. Um, that'll allow for strategic retirement of those older assets without uh, being in a, in a crisis point. Uh, it'll give us options for negotiating new and extended contracts. If we have some if we ha if we're if we've got a resource that's about to retire, but we have some extra capacity, the folks out there selling don't have as much leverage to use on us as if they know that we've got to have it right now. We want to be in the driver's seat, not them. Uh, it allow us to develop proposals for additional renewable resources. Um, I mean, in the, the previous presentation I did on, on types of generation, I think it was clear it's difficult for independence to build its own solar and wind just because of the sheer acreage that's required to get a, a significant amount. Plus, as you saw, 11 megawatts of, of actual generation only gets credit for less than three. So if you want 30, you got to build 100. If you want you know, wind, same thing, 50 or 60 megawatts, and we get credit for 10. So if you want 100, you got to build 600. Uh, big, a big difference when you're talking about capacity versus uh, generation. But we, we know that those, those costs are coming down. We know that the technology is improving. We just don't know what that's going to look like 15, 20 years down the road. Same thing with batteries. Right now, most, most of your battery storage systems have either a two, a four, or a six-hour life. Um, I think the largest one that right now has been put into service is only 80, 80 megawatts, uh, and in three hours, it's done. Our normal load in the summer is over 200. So an 80 megawatt, an 80 megawatt battery storage, we would have it depleted fairly quickly. And when it's done, now you have to have something else to charge it back up with. Um, there are forecasts that say that that is going to improve 
the cost is going to come down. And with some fairly sophisticated control systems, you'll be able to, like when the sun passes over and your solar farm dips for five minutes, you won't start up a generator. You'll just take it out of that battery bank. That's, that is something we can look into. Substation J might be a great location for that. The old Blue Valley Power Plant, that building that sits there, maybe that's a good location. Uh, but those are things that right now are the the tech, the state of the technology just isn't there yet uh, to make it a uh, utility scale. Um, but we don't want to eliminate that as an option down the road. Uh, just just uh, some pictures of that um, battery storage right now. NREL is the National Renewable Energy Laboratory under the Department of Energy. Right now, their current estimates are that the battery systems are about a million dollars a megawatt. So it's right up there. It's right up there in the same ballpark as your combustion turbines and reciprocated engines. Some of the, what what might the future look like? Well, if we get a a modest unit that we've put in place now, um, that'll allow us the opportunity to start looking at some of the other options. We've asked in our proposal, we said, we want it to be capable of burning hydrogen. That'll help help reduce the carbon footprint of that resource. And as that, gender, as that technology improves, we'd be able to adapt and possibly increase that percentage down the road. Some of the things that would be possible, uh, within a couple of years, we might be able to retire Sub-J and then start looking at maybe a battery bank to put in there. Um, maybe after we retire Substation I, we look at additional wind contracts. Uh, maybe another, depending on the how the market looks and how the, the SPP region is operating, it, it may be that another, uh, another uh, combustion turbine or reciprocated engine that might be appropriate. One of the things that's happening right now, everybody around us, the big players, Evergy, Ameren, uh, Omaha Public Power District, the Nebraska Public Power District, all of them are putting in plans for large solar and wind farms and retiring their coal plants. As we have more and more of that renewable energy on the grid, there's gonna be more and more need for those peaking units to pick up when the wind dies and support that power demand. Uh, the, the boiler plants can't respond that fast. So as that percentage of wind and solar continues to increase, that need for those peaking units is gonna increase as well. Um, so again, these are just some ideas that, that staff had of, of what the future might look like down the road. And it's the conversations that we're gonna have to have as we evaluate both this initial proposal and uh, where, SP, where IP, IPL goes down. Subject to your questions. Thank you for such a thoughtful presentation. I know that we've been walking around this for many, many months, and I just found that to be really helpful. I don't have a good sense when you say modest. What does modest mean? By modest, I'm saying uh, something under $100 million. <laughs> so it's not based on megawatts, it's based on cost. Uh, a little bit of both. Uh, probably something maybe maybe in the uh, you know 50 to 60 megawatt range. Um, we have we have some I mean some interesting proposals that are up to 100 megawatts and a little higher, different combinations of, of generation. Uh, and we're looking at all of those to see you know what is the most what makes the most sense economically and uh, as well as the uh, operating. I've got a couple questions. <clears throat> the property to the north of the current Blue Valley plant, is there anything built on that property now? Are you talking about the where the ash ponds are? Is that what is that is what's north of that plant? Yeah, if you if you look if you do an aerial view there, what looks like some like circular areas that are vacant. That's the old ash ponds. Uh, they are closed. Uh, we have monitoring wells in place, and there are uh, there's restrictions on what we can do there because uh, we can't penetrate the cap. 
I guess my, my question is, what were, is there any expansion area in that neighborhood that we could use to expand that power plant to make it much larger in the future? The areas that we, the areas that we own are the areas inside our fence, which include the ash ponds. Um, it's possible that we could do some solar installations out over the ash ponds. We would just have to be very careful on how that was done uh, to make sure that it, it met with uh, the Department of Natural Resources restrictions on, on monitoring those closed ash ponds. I guess what I'm thinking is <clears throat> if you could build a larger generation plant in that location, you have all the transmission lines that are in place and it might be easier to site something in that neighborhood opposed to going to a brand new location to start from scratch. And, and that is one of the reasons why we suggested that we take advantage of this, of this replacement opportunity because it is already an industrial site. It, it has limited uh, you know, residential around it. Uh, so the, the, the social impact is much less using that location than trying to build somewhere else, you're correct. Other questions I have are, <clears throat> you, you said that you started the process in October and you had 120 days for your bids. I'd have to check the exact date of, cause it's, it, the, the clock actually starts in the date that the, the waiver was entered into the federal register. We got the letter in October. Uh, there was a comment period uh, that, would, that would have to be satisfied before the actual commencement date, um, but the um, 36 month is basically from, so from October plus whatever the comment period was, would be the time frame for the for the FERC waiver. No, he saw, I think he was talking about the 120 days nope. for the bids, which oh, was due yes. January 31st. The so. bids were the bids were due by the end of end of December. Or December 31st. Uh, so sorry. we would have 120 days from the end of December. Um, uh, it's possible that um, it's possible we could negotiate with a the winning the winning bid if we took longer than that. It, it's possible we could still get them to honor those prices, but it could be subject to escalation if we take too long. Okay. Is there any other questions? Go ahead. One more. Um, obviously, I'm the process person, so this I really like to be crystal clear about that. So you'll do your evaluation with some of your staff members, and you have an engineering consultant. Correct. You will come up with a list of two or three, or you will say this is the very best one, and then you'll come back and present to the P PUAB, and we make a final recommendation to the city council. Is that, I just, can you walk me yes. through how that works? We will, we will present to you our recommendation. Okay. Um, now, information on the other bids will be available. Okay. Uh, we'll be able to you know, answer questions on why we chose this one over that one. Um, but we will make, we will do our due diligence to come up with what, based on the criteria that we, that we used, what we think is the best fit, and we'll, we'll recommend that to you. And so will we have a shared city council meeting, PUAB, so they get to hear the presentation with us, and then we make a recommendation, or how does this work? That would be up to you and the city council. Okay. I just want to be sure that we have plenty of time for discussion and that we get to make a thoughtful and reasoned recommendation to the city council. They can choose to do what they want with that, but I just want to be sure that we are fulfilling our responsibility as the PUAB. Certainly. I have a question. Are you are you wanting a motion from this board today? No, no. sir. Okay. I just wanted I wanted to give you food for thought, help you understand what we are using. Uh, you know the things that we're considering as we walk through this process, uh, so that you can kind of if there's questions that if this spurs questions from you next week, call me. And, and we'll, we'll do our best to answer those questions. We'll keep you as informed as we can so that when, when we come to you with the presentation, I don't want it to hit you cold. I do have one other question, and it's not related to this. How much electricity is lost between the wind farms and the grid? I mean, we're getting credit for that, correct? We're not that 
electricity never makes it here. Correct. We we don't. The way the way I, I explained this, uh, I think a couple of years ago. Um, picture a big picture a big water tank. Okay. Everybody in everybody in that fourteen state region, if SPP calls on you to start your generator, you're dumping into the tank. Somewhere at the bottom, you've got a spigot that you draw off of. Whose energy are you getting? It's it's the pools. So yes, we get credit for what's produced at the wind farm. Um, it doesn't actually come here to Independence, but it's credit to our account. Correct. Now, once again, if let's say there weren't the pool and we had the wind farm splitters at 250 miles away, how much loss of electricity takes place between point A and point B? I would have to check with our engineering staff to get an assessment of that. But um, part of the when when you are when you are buying and selling energy on the market, that tra those transmission losses and transmission costs are figured into that. Is it okay? Which is one of the reasons why um, when you're on your own in the market, you generally are paying higher because you're you're paying for a lot of transmission that you're not necessarily wouldn't necessarily use if you were going through SPP. Thank you. Is there any other questions? On the proposal or? Whatever you want. Well, first of all, my mom wanted me to say thank you for getting her energy back on uh, after she, she had an outage. So I just wanted to pass the appreciation of an 80 year old lady who worries about her heat. So there you go. Um, the second question I had was really about the refinancing. And so I don't know where that question should go. Does that come to you, Adam? Thank you. So, so that'd typically be a Brian or Cindy question, but I'll, if you want to give me your questions and then I will respond to you later, probably would be the best way to do that because I don't want to say something wrong. Sure. So in the past, those have come to the PYB and we talked about them, made a recommendation to the city council. While I understand interest rates are going up and there was probably time pressure I just always want to be thoughtful about process that those things should come to PUAB and we make a recommendation to the city council and we found out about it on the city council agenda. And so somewhere along the line, being sure that we are at least looped in so we could ask questions since we have responsibility for being that voice of public. And I just want to make sure we keep that in mind. Sure. Um, so. Brian, I know, is listening, so if I say something wrong, he'll probably text me here in a second. But the selection, what the action that occurred uh, on Tuesday's agenda was selection of an underwriter. I believe there would be um, more um, decision points later that the PUAB would be involved in. That was just simply yes. finding the under. Yeah, oh, I'm okay. involved in that as well, so yeah. I'll give it to Joe then. Yeah, yeah I'm. Not the lead by any means. I'm still a new guy, but uh, I am involved in those discussions. So yeah, that was just the choosing of the underwriter. So when we get to the specifics of the actual refinancing and everything, they have the city council and PUAB schedules. So we would bring that before you. But that was just picking Morgan Stanley as Got the it. as the underwriter okay. for that refinancing of those bonds. Thank you. I appreciate that. And Brian sent me a message that that'll be on the February meeting for you all. Okay. All right. Thank you. I don't want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any other questions or discussion? Upcoming items. Do we even address that or is this just for information? You can if you'd like uh, someone to respond to when those will be or if they have any additional information. On the uh, annual audit of pilot, does anyone want to address that? There'll be, a, there'll be a presentation in February on that. Okay. I think we've already discussed the development of future generation. Yes. The as we again as we proceed with the um, evaluation and move forward, we'll continue to address uh, you all appropriately uh, on all the steps of that. The 15-year electric consumption study. I think we answered that. 
um, a, a couple of pres uh, uh, last month or the month before we had we showed the graph that showed our actual uh, like over the last five years it shows our load it shows our the the winter the winter and summer peaks the some or the shoulder valleys and how it's it's fairly consistent and in in the that one graph that I showed you today it shows just a modest a modest increase in our load over the next 20 30 years and it says uh, Rockwood solar panels are we going to have a presentation on that next month that, that won't be next month um, there's this is a follow-up or we're putting this as a placeholder from Tuesday's City Council meeting um, there are other departments involved and other commissions involved and uh, given the workload that our team is, is doing right now, I think uh, we'll let that de defer to that department initially to do some work on that and that commission and then we'll get IPL involved kind of as a second step to that. So uh, that's, that's probably a couple months out at least. Okay. Oh. It looks like we have a citizen that would like to speak in front of us, Lowell Crow. Yep. Would you like a microphone, sir? I'm going to go up to the podium, but okay. I wanted to ask, uh, did you want to give the board members an opportunity to actually, comment anymore? Actually, I'd like to do that after your... After mine? Yes, sir. Okay. Unfortunately, I'm going to miss your speech today, but wow. I did see you Tuesday night, so, okay. uh, but I have, an, I have a four o'clock, so I apologize, everybody. Look forward to seeing our, seeing our remaining team members next time. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, board members. My name is uh, Lowell Croft. Some of you know who I am already, but some don't. Um, I've uh, been a resident here in Independence for over 45 years. Um, didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to the utilities. You know, I was like probably the, the average citizen, too busy with work and, and life to really pay really close attention other than every time I got my bill, it seemed like it was going up and up and up. So back in uh, what, when, what really triggered me to get more involved was back in 2018 when they instituted or installed the new billing system. And it was such a fiasco that and being an IT person all my life, I couldn't believe how screwed up it was whenever they implemented it. It's like they never tested it. So that really kind of started the ball rolling with me becoming more involved. I can remember uh, along the way finding out about the, util the, the PUAB and even talking with Jack Looney at that time, who was the chairman of PUAB. And I, I asked him, can I come to those meetings? And he said, you can come, but you can't talk. Okay. <laughs> so, so anyway, so I started coming to the meetings and started learning as much as I possibly could, uh, you know, about the activities uh, with the utilities and especially with IPL, since that seemed to be the, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge revenue source uh, or revenue generator, I should say. Uh, and so I really wanted to learn all I could about that. So that's kind of where I started from, just to give you an idea. Um, and let's see. Uh, last month, I distributed a letter to everybody, and it was regarding the uh, full public hearing that the mayor and the council put on the agenda you know, back uh, earlier that month. And I went to that council meeting, and, and I got up and spoke because I was just appalled that they would actually have that as, a, as an agenda item on the, on the council agenda, and they didn't publicize it. I mean, they don't want anybody to come up there and speak up about things. I have on quite a few occasions, you know, done that. And including that night, I got up and told them that I thought this was a poor excuse to call this a, you know, a full public hearing when they didn't, they didn't publish it. And the mayor even made the comment, it was, you know, we did our legal responsibility by putting it, posting it on the agenda, which I thought was poor. Um, anyway. Um, so when I talk with other friends and neighbors around Independence, 
you know, regarding utilities, because I'm, I'm curious to get their input as well. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, just wanted to be sure. Um, and the, the basic reaction that I get is that they think that the utility bills are too high regarding electricity. That was one, the one I heard about the most. Um, the, the latest one that they're really complaining about is the, the increase that Spire has, has put on its own the natural gas, but you know, that's out of our control. Uh, but then the other thing that I'm hearing more and more about is why is the sewer charge so high? And I know you spoke a little bit to that at one of the previous POAB meetings, uh, Lisa, but just so you know, I hear that more and more that people are questioning why it's so high. Um, the water, it's too bad Dan's gone, but uh, he would like what I'd say. But everybody thinks that the water is reasonable. So you know, it seems to be, and um, you know, the one thing that I will you know, offer to all the utility uh, people is that I think all of you do a fantastic job. Um, even though we may not like what we're getting charged for it in some cases, I think you all are doing an excellent job overall. Um, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to touch on a little bit is you all are very familiar with what the city charter says in, in regards to uh, the operation of the utilities and in regards to the, the POAB activities. Um, but there's one very significant thing in the charter that uh, I wanted to just bring up briefly, uh, and that is that it specifically says, the electric utility shall not be operated for the benefit of other municipal functions and shall not be used directly or indirectly as a general revenue producing agency for the city. But it, and in, kind of emphasize, may uh, pay to the city an amount in lieu of such taxes as are normally placed upon private business enterprises. And the reason, and that's the pilot tax, which I think we all are familiar with, but the part in you have one said, minute, Mr. Croft. Okay, thank you. The thing I want to point out, though, is it says it may do that. It doesn't say it's required. The other thing is, is I want to make sure that everybody kind of pays attention to is that it says that it should be uh, uh, taxes that are based on in lieu of such taxes as are uh, normally placed upon private business enterprises. Well, I found out not too long ago that. You know, here we're paying the the nine point what is nine point oh six percent, whatever the pilot tax is. Um, but you know, the other the phone people, the cable people, the gas you know, Spire, the gas company, they're not paying that. They're not paying the, the full nine percent. They all have con contracted to pay a lesser amount. So I question why we as ratepayers are having to pay, you know, the higher uh, pilot tax. Uh, so. And then I think you also look at the Bondurant, you know, a lot of you, if you haven't read the Bondurant decision, you ought to go back and read it. It was Judge Bondurant, and basically he just reiterated everything that's in the city charter. He didn't really change anything. He just reiterated that the city charter says this and you need to abide by it. So uh, make sure that we, uh, I just, and I just want to hold it to that. I also want to, I'm, I'm hoping that the city council will quit trying to run the, you know, the utility departments. They need to let the administration group take care of that and staff. So that's all I have. I appreciate you letting me speak. I'm, hey, I'm glad I got to be the first one. <laughs> and I didn't even realize it was in the rules and procedures until, uh, you know, I can't remember who, I think uh, Karen DeLucci actually pointed that out to me. So just so you know. Thank, thank you. you. Very, thank you very much for speaking. At this time, is there any board member comments? You guys want to go home, don't you? <laughs> I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? All in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Meetings adjourned.